Okay, so good morning, everyone. So I think we can start with the first talk of this morning. So in case you just sit down and prepare. Okay, so the first talk of today will be Yang Walu from the University of Hong Kong. And she will speak about cluster algebras of finite type and both Samuelson varieties. Hello, Lu, how are you? So Hello. Well, talk. thank you very much. Thank you, David. Um, uh, I'd like to thank the organizers, uh, such a great job, and I really also feel very sorry that I, that, and I can't be there. And then thanks for the organizers for allowing me to give this talk online. Okay, so um, so the, top, the title will be Cluster Algebras of Finite Type uh, and about Samuelson Varieties. So my, my uh, talk will have three parts. In the first part, I'll just give a brief uh, discussion on the concept of total positivity. And this just serves as, a, as motivation and also some background information and also uh, intro introducing some uh, notation um, This uh, for, for the second part. So the second part is about the concept of mutations, mutations in class algebra, but I will uh, be mainly discussing mutations of what, uh, what what I'll, what I'll call T-Poisson seeds. Um, so this is in the context of mutations of Poisson algebras, but um, motivating and, and discussing it uh, from the point of view of Poisson geometry. Uh, then the very last part will be a particular example, which is a, a, a so-called class of variety of finite type. Okay, so that example will be very explicit. Okay, so, okay. So the first part, uh, motivation for from total positivity. Let me just give some uh, definitions um, to start with. Uh, so I'll be starting with a, a rational irreducible variety over C. So a rational means that you have a big an open the risky sub variety, which is uh, irrational to C, to the power of C, to the dimension of, um, the, if N is the dimension. And then, um, so by what we call a toric chart, uh, by definition, is an open embedding of the n-dimensional torus into y. Okay, so this will be called a toric chart. Now, two toric charts are set to be positively equivalent. If if you look at the transition maps between the uh, the transition uh, maps between the coordinates, and they should be sub subtraction free, so there's no negative signs. So so each one of these is a is a, a n tuple of rational functions, and then so it's polynomial over polynomial, then you require that in the polynomials, there are no negative signs, okay? Subtraction free expressions. Uh, so this is two toric charts being positively equivalent. And then there was this concept uh, about a po uh, of a positive structure. The positive structure on Y is, a, is simply a positive equivalence class of toric charts, okay? And then a positive variety is a variety together with a positive structure. So this is a very simple definition. It's very much similar to how we define a manifold or how we define a complex manifold. So we just by requiring, make requirements on the transition maps yeah, between the coordinates. Um, now, what do we do? Why is this a useful concept? Uh, so if you have a positive structure on a variety, then you get two things. First of all, you have a well-defined, totally positive part. Okay, so this is a subset of your variety where a point is set to be totally positive if it has positive coordinates in any one of the toric charts. Okay, now since all the toric charts are related in a positive way, then it's, it has positive coordinates in every one of them. So, <clears throat> so this is called a totally positive part is well-defined, independent of which coordinates you use according to the chart you use to test. Um, the second one is the, uh, you also have a well-defined class of so-called positive functions. So this will be uh, rational functions on your variety, which again has subtraction, subtraction free rational expressions in the coordinate functions in any chart, any of the toric charts, right? So again, this is well-defined. Okay, and then now um, this is interesting. Uh, the, in particular, the, the so-called totally non-negative part, which is defined to be the closure. Let's say you have uh, using uh, this classical topology, you take the classical topology, take the closure inside your variety, 
And then this can be very interesting. The most famous, famous example, well, uh, the, one of the famous examples, I'll say, is the so-called positive grass manning. Yeah, so this is a positive structure on the grass manning. And then um, this is, has to do with uh, some very recent uh, developments in physics and so on. Um, so I will recall a, a, another example, which is um, the, so the total positivity of matrices. So before I do that, uh, let me just make one more remark. Um, so if you have a positive structure, then if you have one toric chart, you can use it to do two things. First of all, you have a parameterization of the totally positive part. You simply set the coordinates to be positive, right? I mean, the, the parameters to be positive. Remember, rho is a map from the torus to your variety. You just make every parameter positive. So by definition, then this is a, in, this is a parameterization. Yeah, this is from the definition of the totally positive part. The other one is a testing criteria uh, that you can, for that, you need to solve the inverse of the, uh, the embedding. And so that, that is a map from your variety to, it's a birational map from your variety to CN. So that's the inverse of the embedding. Uh, so then you call this phi one, phi two, phi n, you call them coordinate functions. And then, uh, so I will call this uh, the torus, these are parameters, and then these are coordinate functions. Yeah? Then a point is positive if and only if it has positive coordinate in, um, it, it for every, every coordinate is positive. So again, this is the definition. Uh, so this just comes from the definition. The whole point is that um, you just, every chart would give you two, two of these things, parameterization and testing criteria, okay? So now, uh, a tor we say the torus is regular, the toric embedding is regular if its inverse map can be chosen uh, or consists of regular functions, right? So it's not, not polynomial over polynomial, but uh, just the rational function, which is defined as, as a regular function defined everywhere. Now, such charts are nice because then you get testing criteria by using regular functions. So you don't have to worry, worry about whether your function is defined uh, on the whole variety or not. Okay, so this is some background on um, total positivity. Um, so uh, sorry, I just forgot to say. So therefore, you should construct as many regular toric charts as possible. So it's just the general idea. Um, now, the, the so I'll briefly mention the the classical total positivity of matrices. This is a very classical uh, concept, uh, uh, object, uh, topic. Sorry. Um, so an n by n complex matrix is set to be totally positive and we write it as g bigger than zero, if all of these minors are positive. So remember, minors are the determinant of, of square submatrices. Yeah? So those are called minors. So for example, for, for the n by n matrix, you have so one by one minor, two by two minors, so you have this many minors. Yeah? So you have all of these minors. Um, you need to, by definition, in principle, you need to test all these minors are required to be positive. So for example, if you have a three by three matrix, you have 90 minors. So if you have never seen this, yeah, if this is the first time you, you see this, and then you will find it rather challenging, in fact, to actually write down at just at least one example, even just one example, because you have uh, you need the, all the two by two minors to be positive, the determinant to be positive. It's not that, uh, I'm not saying that it's very hard, but um, so, so the general question is, do they exist from arbitrary n by n? As I said, this is an old classical topic. Uh, the answer is yes, and how do you parameterize them? And then this, the statement is that you can you have many parameterizations using n square parameters. So n square, uh, of course, is the size of the matrix. Uh, for the testing criteria, you don't need to test on all of them. You just need to test on a selection of n square of them. Um, so I'll say a bit more about this. And then therefore, so the question is, uh, is there an uh, underlying positive structure? The, the answer is yes, and this is the work of Lustig. And this works for any reductive group. So I'll quickly go through, I, though this is also to set up notation for, my, for later on. So we start with um, G, uh, which is connected, simply connect the same simple Lie group. And so this, and Borel subgroups. So, uh, so think about the example um, SLN, then the, there will be upper triangular, lower triangular matrices. And the maximal torus will be the set of all diagonal matrices. Uh, we also fix the simple roots and fix the uh, root vectors. Okay, so this is a, a little bit uh, Lie theory. And then we have, once we fixed um, that, and then we have this uh, one parameter subgroups. 
Okay, so I'll give an example. I'll look at the example of SL3 uh, very quickly. And then you have the vowel group, which is generated by the simple reflections. And then the longest element in the vowel group is denoted as W0. So Lustig's um, uh, uh, theory says that you start with any reduced words, two reduced words, they don't have to be the same for the longest element. And then you can define a toric embedding uh, into G. Okay, the dimension of G is the dimension of the torus, maximal torus plus twice of the length of the longest element. So you need that many parameters. So, uh, right. So have R parameters and then twice uh, L naught parameters. And the way that you just multiply them inside the group. Uh, so this will be in the case of L SO, N, and this will be lower triangular matrices on the left. And then you have the middle, you have the um, diagonal matrices in the maximal torus. And then you have upper triangular matrices on the right. You simply multiply them. You let this, then you have these parameters to be all non-zero. And then Lustig says that this is, a, this is a toric embedding, okay? And then, but the most important thing is that if you take two different choices of reduced words, uh, these two toric charts are positively equivalent. So therefore they have, they give uh, the same uh, positive structure, okay? So therefore we define the Lustig positive structure to be the one uh, you, the toric chart, equivalence class of toric charts using any of any pair of reduced words for the longest element. The corresponding G positive part, sorry, totally positive part will be called the totally positive part of G. Okay. So then um, using my general discussion, if you have a, uh, so any choice of this uh, pair of reduced words for W naught, give a toric chart, therefore will give you a parameterization. Okay just by setting all the parameters to be positive. Um, so then, by, so this is just, at this point, it's just a definition. So what Fomian and Zelewinski uh, discovered, or they solved in this, in this paper in uh, 1999, was that they, they, they computed the inverse of the Lustig map, the parameterization map. Whoops. And then they, they found that the inverse, so this is going, so the inverse of the map is going from the group to, uh, to copies of C. Huh? So this is, they are described in terms of uh, so-called twisted generalized minors. Okay, so we, they call this inverse parameter problem. Um, so then what are generalized minors? They are, they are just usual minors for matrices in the case of SLN. Um, in general, they are described as matrix coefficients for cert, for the, from the uh, fundamental representations. Okay, uses to the so-called extremal weights inside the fundamental representation. So uh, you can just think about this, think about the, this as the uh, generalization of what we normally call minors for a, matrix, for a matrix. So the consequence then is that since the inverse is expressed in terms of generalized minors, so what you get is the testing criteria using uh, the generalized minors that are involved in this per particular parameterization. And there are, uh, dimension G of them. Okay, so that's the, so the number of them is the same as the dimension of the group. So in the case of, um, it, the, uh, then another, so this is again a, 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 a theorem of Fomian Zelewinski that um, a point is totally positive if and only if its value is, is positive for every generalized minor. So now if you consider the case of SLN or GLN, you recover the classical total positivity. Okay, so, so this is the background for total positivity for matrices. Um, okay. Now, for example, if I quickly go through SL, uh, GL3 or SL3, um, so you have, for example, you take these two reduced words, uh, then the whole thing is nine dimensional, so you need nine parameters. So this is what I meant by multiplying. So the, the three lower triangular matrices, a diagonal, and then three upper triangular matrices, you multiply them together, and it looks like this. Okay, so the statement is that as long as all the parameters are positive um, real numbers, then you get a post totally positive matrix. So all the two by two uh, determinants will be um, positive. The whole determinant is also positive. That, that's obvious. It's actually, yeah. Um, so then, but, but this does not give you the testing criteria. So, so the, the, the fact that this being a parameterization means that every positive, totally positive matrix is of this form. Okay. But this still does not solve the testing criteria. So uh, now if you, you have, for that, you have to write the, write the parameters as functions of G. And then, then here, is a, here are some examples. 
Uh, so one example would look like this. So the, the generalized, the miners involved in solving the reverse, the, the inverse parameter problem are this. So you don't need, you can see that there are, there are five one by one miners and two, uh, sorry, three two by two miners and the determinant involved, or you could also get this. Okay, so um, now each one of this will give a total positive criteria. So there are exactly only nine of them. So you don't need all 19. Um, there are many more. I just give two examples. Now, now the now the the the, the question now is how come that both one and two are uh, positivity positivity criteria? Uh, that's because they are related by a very simple re um, a relation that there is only one one function that's being changed. So a two two becomes a one one, and these two are related by this very simple relation. This is a, a determinant relation, and that's so. This is a typical example of what's called cluster mutation. Okay, so this is how uh, they discovered cluster mutation um, when trying to understand uh, the total positivity criteria for Lustig's uh, total positivity. Okay, so um, so now, so yeah, this is what I meant. So cluster mutations were discovered to understand Lustig total positivity. So let me uh, make it a bit more precise. What is a cluster mutation? So um, a cluster mutation is a particular type of change of coordinates. Okay, it's a coordinate of a very particular form, very special. If you already have one set of coordinates, you only change one of them uh, in a very particular way. So the way you change it is of this form. So the new one is a monomial plus a monomial div divided by the old one. Okay, now here M is a column vector. So I write it as a, uh, so all my integral vectors are column vectors. Uh, so M is a column vector, but then it has a, you look at all the positive entries, you put them in. Can you see my mouse here? I, I suppose, yeah. Okay, so the positive parts are put, so the, here is a monomial using all the positive entries. And then you also use the, all the negative entries, but you put a negative sign in front of it. So they appear in the second monomial. Uh, so it's a monomial plus a monomial divided by 5K. So this is uh, the simplest way. Well, you can say uh, this is a very simple way of changing coordinates. Okay, so this is called a cluster mutation. Now, because of the plus sign, then it's clear that cluster mutations are positive. Yeah, there's no negative signs involved. So this is a cluster mutation. So we can make it a bit more precise. So here I'm only talking about mutation in one direction, direction K. Now you can mutate in different directions. Uh, so that's so that's why you actually you don't you uh, you need more than one column vector. Uh, you you could have a matrix of column vectors, and then you can uh, mutate in each direction. So let me make it uh, a slightly more uh, precise definition. So what's called a seed inside? So C round bracket Y is the field of rational functions on your variety. Yeah? So a seed in Y is a pair where phi is um, basically so what I call a coordinate chart, yeah, a, co a set of coordinates. So it's so or algebraically is a set of uh, algebraically independent generators for the field of rational functions, and uh, it's also called an extended cluster. Okay, so an M is so it's called a mutation matrix or an exchange matrix where uh, you have a column for each. So you are given a subset so for a particular subset in the index set. Um, you have one column for each uh, for each for each k, and this is called the mutation matrix, and this is called the seed. Okay, so a seed has two things. So a seed is a pair; it's a set of coordinates plus a matrix um, consisting of um, the size of the matrix is not necessarily square. Okay, um, so we'll talk more about this subset, um, the ex exchange subset. So we use columns of M to mutate phi in in the direction of k, sorry, this is a, in the direction of each uh, exchange direction. And then you get an, a, a, a new set of coordinates, right? So this is called, uh, but here when I say this, um, what I'm after mutation, all I get is the set of um, a, a new coordinates. Now, so what um, uh, in class algebra, what people discovered, so mainly at the very beginning due to uh, these three people, uh, was that they found a systematic way of mutating seeds, 
Okay, so mutating seeds is, diff is more than just mutating the coordinate charts. Okay, for the coordinate charts, I just need a set of generators, but I, I also need to, after I have mutated once, I also need to know how do I mutate, uh, mutate next? So I need another mutation matrix. So for a seed, you need a pair. Okay, so they found a systematic way of mutating seeds. And, and then uh, of course the more main motivation was because the total positivity criteria for agnostics are total positivity, uh, they were related by sequences of such mutations. Okay, they are not just arbitrary positively related relations then they are particular uh, sequences of class compositions of sequences of cluster mutations. Okay, and then of, then they formulated the notion of a cluster structure on a variety. Uh, but the, actually, the, the you know, original definition is all in algebraic language. It's all in terms of algebras. Uh, I should say uh, what I call cluster structures. Um, these are uh, for cast algebras of geometrical type. Okay, so there's geometry behind. There's a variety behind. Uh, so a cluster structure on a variety is a particular collection of toric charts on the variety, which are pairwise related by a sequence of cluster mutations. Okay. Um, okay. So, so basic example. Uh, so, are there any questions so far? Is this okay? Now, basic examples of cluster varieties. So, discovered by um, at the beginning. So, they were, they were from Lie theory. They were double Bruja cells. So these are, so I have already set up, uh, so B and B minus are just a pair of opposite Borel subgroups. Double Borel cells are sub varieties of G defined by such intersections, where U and V is a pair of um, vowel group elements. Uh, what, is, what, what is underlying Lustig so the positivity is the so-called open double Borel cell. Okay, so this is open. So that is, um, uh, that is the, the background for total positivity for um, a cluster structure. Okay, so I, um, so that that uh, finishes my first part. Oh, I don't, sorry, oops. Okay, uh, it's hiding my title. Okay, so now what is the relation to Poisson geometry of all of this? Um, the key point is that the group G has a so-called standard multiplicity Poisson structure. This is the semi-classical limit of the quantum group that everybody studies. Um, it's defined by using the classical R matrix. So I call standard because there are many uh, multiplicity Poisson structures. This is the standard one. Um, uh, it, I don't, I'm not gonna give the definition. I'm not gonna recall the definition, but it suffices to know that, or to recall that um, it has, of course, it has, it's symplectic leaves, now, what I call T leaves, so T is again the maximal torus, T leaves are toric, the T orbits of symplectic leaves. So it's T leaves are precisely uh, the double Braha cells. Okay, so that is the relation. So, 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 and moreover, all the cluster toric coordinates that, that are obtained, so the, 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 uh, by mute in a, in a cluster structure, they are all log canonical with respect to the Poisson structure. So for us, as a, a, as a person interested in Poisson geometry, how do we think about uh, cluster structures? So I, I, uh, so I think about this in terms of coordinates and mainly, th so, so, so the statement is that they are all log canonical coordinates for the Poisson structure. So that's our starting point, uh, try to understand um, cluster structures. At least that's my uh, starting point. So cluster toric, all the cluster toric coordinates are log canonical coordinates. Okay, so therefore, so uh, now since since uh, the uh, since the, the the so this is called so this one I call I call the the one on double Braha cell I call this BFZ cluster structure. I'll talk a bit more about uh, more detail about this cluster structure. Um, so. Uh, since they are mutating log canonical coordinates. So therefore it's a very natural question that we ask um, from the point of view of Poisson geometry, is there a particular way of mutating log canonical coordinates? Okay, so if I have one set of log canonical coordinates, is there a, a good way of getting another one? Okay, so that is the motivation for the second part. Um, so this is so what I so this second part is more so this is all more or less in the literature, uh, perhaps slightly uh, differently formulated. Um, 
So let me just give uh, uh, recall what is a uh, uh, just a T Poisson variety or T Poisson manifold. So T will be the complex torus. Uh, a T Poisson manifold is just a Poisson manifold with a T action preserving the Poisson structure. So this notion of T leaves, um, a T leaf in a T Poisson manifold um, is a Poisson sub manifold, which is a union of symplectic leaves by by picking one symplectic leaf and let the torus act on it. You take the union. So that's the toric orbit of symplectic leaves. But I also ask the, the, the tangential map, so this map being a, so the action map being a submersion, which means that uh, at, uh, at the tangent space level, the tangent space at any point is the sum. Yeah, it's spanned by the tangent space to the orbit and the tangent space to the symplectic leaf. So that is the uh, de definition of a tea leaf. Uh, so as I said, the double braha cells are the famous examples of tea leaves. Okay, so, um, So if I have a T Poisson variety, so let me let me again make it very clear. So what do we mean by uh, T Poisson coordinate chart? So a T Poisson coordinate chart uh, is is a coordinate chart to start with. Okay, so it's a birational map. I'm working with the varieties. Okay, so uh, so all my coordinate the open subsets are the risky open. Uh, T means that each coordinate function has to be a T weight vector for the T action. Okay, that's what the T part is. The Poisson part says that these coordinate functions must be log canonical. I also require that um, I also require that uh, the the Poisson coefficients are um, integers. Okay, so that's the definition of a T Poisson T coordinate T Poisson coordinate chart. Okay, now here comes the mutation. So what do we mean by mutation? We want to mutate in a very particular way, meaning that we want to produce a new the T Poisson coordinate chart in this very particular way. Um, so, oh, sorry, let me, uh, so K is any, any one of the index is from, from one to N and taking an integral vector, column vector, uh, whose K by K entry is zero. And then we define the new function by the way that I described earlier, and I rewrite it. So, so I take out this monomial, and then what I have, so it's a rewriting of this uh, same expression, yeah, same function. So the question is, question one, um, what is the condition on this integral vector such that this new phi prime, okay, with only one coordinate changed in this very particular way, when is that again a T Poisson coordinate chart? So that is the question. Okay, so this is how we are going to we're going to change the coordinates. Okay, the answer is very simple: is linear algebra. Um, uh, the, so so that so the condition on this integral vector is is a linear is some linear equations. So if and only if. So first of all, uh, so so this chi. So remember. So oh, I don't need. Okay, so chi. So chi of phi is a vector of weights. So it's the weights for each of the coordinate functions. So this is a row vector and then mk is a column vector. So when you multiply, is uh, what you get is, a, is the character of t. Yeah? So you want that to be zero. And the other thing is this omega phi is the Poisson co coefficient matrix. So that's an, that's an n by n integral matrix. So that multiplied to mk must be um, it must be a, a, a multiple of the case standard column basis vector. So it has zeros everywhere except at kth entry, where is one. So that is this statement. Now, this is, you can prove this by, uh, by a calculation. Um, in fact, the, um, uh, the, the, this is, uh, if you are clever with notation, you just need it like a one, half page or one page, half a page uh, calculation. But I like to give you a more conceptual explanation for this, for, for this condition. Um, so, it, so you can rewrite, uh, re, uh, rephrase this condition as two things. So this one of course means that if you consider this whole monomial, you know, so all the positive entries or negative entries all multiplied together, this whole monomial, and this has, to, this has T weight, and that's obvious. That's what this means. The first equation means that this monomial has zero T weight, okay? Now the second monomial, uh, the, sorry, the second equation, second condition says that the Hamiltonian vector field 
of this log of this the log of this monomial is given is is given in this particular form. That's that's what it means. That's just a, a way, another way of formulating that second condition. Okay, so that's the so these are the two conditions. That's how do we think about this? The first of all, this monomial has to be t, t, has t weight zero has zero t weight. A second one is about the Hamiltonian vector field of this monomial has to be of that very particular form. Now notice that since it's this very particular form is very easy to, to uh, integrate it, right? If, so inside this coordinates, it just has only one non-zero entry. So all the other, so if you integrate the Hamiltonian flow of this function, basically you just get the dilation in the, uh, in, in the K coordinates, right? Okay. Now, I also want to say that I want this lambda k to be zero to be non-zero because otherwise this function is a Casimir, then I, then it's not a nice and interesting change of coordinates. Okay. Now I'd like to give a further explanation. So so the explanation that the condition says that uh, these conditions are if and only if conditions for this new coordinate charge to be log canonical, to be t log canonical. Now the t part, the t weight part is very clear. If you remember the sorry, if you remember the definition. Um, uh, of this change, uh, because the here this part is a monomial is already a t weight. Yeah, if you want the whole thing to be a t weight, then this uh, this f phi to the m k must have weight zero. So that's very easy to understand. Um, so why do we require this, uh, or how do we think about this change of coordinates uh, in terms of the Hamiltonian flow? Okay, that's what I like to explain. Um, so what we think about this change of coordinates as an automorphism on the field of rational functions. Uh, so you just change one generator to a new generator. And so this is in fact a composition of two. Uh, this composition, the first one is the monomial change. So remember that the phi k prime um, is this monomial part plus, times one plus the whole, the whole monomial. So the second part is the rho k. Um, now rho k is actually the, time one flow of the Hamiltonian vector field of not, not the monomial, but L of the monomial. This is the so-called dialogarism function. Yeah. So L of phi to the mk. So L of z is this function. So this is, a, is this function of z. Um, so this is, if you compute, yeah. So now if you compute, because we, I already told you the Hamiltonian the log, Hamiltonian flow of the log of this function. So it's very easy to compute the Hamiltonian flow of this dialogarithm function. And then you compute it just, just one line, and you will see that it's explicitly given by, by this formula. Okay, so if you first of all do the monomial change and then do this, uh, uh, this Hamiltonian uh, Poisson automorphism change, then that, that is your whole change of coordinates. And that also explains very clearly why it's again log canonical, right? Because if you just change in a monomial way, of course it stays log canonical. And then if you change in a Hamiltonian way uh, by a zero weight vector, a zero weight Hamiltonian function, then of course it's again, uh, the, the, the Poisson brackets, the Poisson coefficient brackets don't change, right? So it preserves the Poisson structure. So monomial plus um, composed with the Hamiltonian flow at time one. So that is the meaning of, uh, of this change of coordinates. And, 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 and then so of course, this is very important that this dialogarism um, function appears. Okay. Okay. So therefore, what is our strategy for constructing P Poisson seeds? So I start with, I don't have a seed. Okay. I just have a Poisson. So I want to explain the, the, the T Poisson seeds. I, I, to start with, I just have a T Poisson coordinate chart. I don't have a, the mutation matrix. I don't know in which direction do I mutate, but I know what I want to, right? So, so I say that phi is mutatable in the direction K if I can solve, if there is an uh, a integral, uh, integral vector, column vector, which satisfies this, these two conditions, right? These are the conditions for my um, change of coordinates to be again T Poisson, right? Okay, so I say that, so if you can find such a direction, so, so put all of them together, let's assume this set of Ks is non-empty. So this is, I say the whole phi is mutatable if the exchange set is non-empty. Okay, now if you can, now if this set is not empty, now you solve. Okay, now you're gonna solve equation three, for each k, 
But now you can see that the um, it's not unique, right? Because uh, the solution, because if I multiply by integer, is again a solution. Uh, so therefore, I make additional requirements. I want the, I want this uh, vector to be primitive. Okay, so greatest common divisor to be one. Um, then I also want so also to get rid of this. Uh, I make sure that this uh, the result so omega five times m k is positive. Okay, so that get rid of the negative sign. So, so impose three and four, okay? And then I collect all of them together. So, so for each such possible K, you solve for, for MK and you put this together. So this is going to be called a mutation matrix. Now, at this point, you notice, I just say that you just solve for them. And if you can solve, you, put, you, can, you can find one, you put it together, put it here and you get a mutation matrix. Um, by definition, if this uh, exchange set is now empty, by definition, you do have a mutation matrix, right? So by design, this mutation matrix now can be used to, uh, to do mutations. Um, so now before that, I, so we call this a T plus on seed. Okay, a T plus, now this other word is the seed. Now, so originally I only had the T plus on coordinate chart. So now I have this mutation matrix and put them together. This is called the seed. Now it's called the seed because you can start mutating. So you can do your, first generation mutation, that is you mutate at each exchangeable direction or each mutatable direction. Okay, now there is only, if there's only one K, um, then this is, you can check that this is actually going to be, uh, is, you go back to your original ones, it's not very interesting. Uh, sorry, sorry, uh, I said some, uh, 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 sorry, if you do it twice, you get back. Um, no, even if there's one K, you can still mutate, you get a new uh, coordinate chart, yes. Okay, so, so far I have introduced what's called the T plus on C. Um, the, the motivation is so that um, I can mutate uh, uh, and then I can get another T plus on coordinate chart, yeah? Okay, so then the question two, my question one was, uh, what was my question one? Um, what, what is, what's the condition on those column vectors? Uh, for the new chart to be T plus one. Question two is, uh, suppose I have found, I have done all the first uh, generation mutation, can I continue? Okay, so, so what does that mean? So the answer is yes, what does that mean? So remember that I, I have the original coordinate chart phi, I assume that K is a mutatable direction, I get a new chart. So, and then the question is whether this chart is mutatable. What are the mutatable directions for the new chart? Does it have how, how many directions in which I can mutate this new chart? Can I continue? For that, of course, I need to solve that linear equations again, right? So therefore I need to find the character, uh, the, the, the vector, which is the characters of this one. And I need to find the Poisson coefficient matrix for phi prime. And then I need to solve for that linear equation, right? Okay, now it's very easy. We know very, it's very easy to, to find uh, what the relation between the characters of this new coordinate charts and the old one, because it's very easy because I only changed the one phi, phi k prime. And that phi k prime is just the monomial times something zero weight, right? So it's, basic, so it's just the weight for the, for the monomial. Um, so, so it's very, very simple, okay? But what we notice is, so, so it's, it's written in terms of the, um, Right, only involves the negative part of the mutation matrix. And this is a reflection matrix with squares one. Okay, this is explicitly given by that. And then the Poisson coefficient matrix, as I said, you don't even need to compute uh, because it's a composition of a monomial with something Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian part does not change the Poisson coefficient matrix. So therefore the Poisson coefficient matrix depends only on the monomial change. The monomial change is the same as just the A. Okay, so that's the Poisson mutation matrix. And therefore you just need now to, to solve that linear equation, that, that system of linear equations now for phi prime. Okay, then we just go ahead and do that. Um, when you do that, uh, I need additional uh, 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 piece of information, which is, so the, the definition of the mutation matrix says that omega phi times m phi is a, like a diagonal one. Okay, this is not a square matrix, so this is a diagonal at most possible diagonal places. Um, other, at other places, zero. Um, so, then it, it, so then there's A basically has a, has a transpose, okay? Uh, so you need to figure out, so you basically you take the principal part of A 
uh, for those rows and columns corresponding to k in the exchange um, in set set, and then take the transpose, and then because of this lambda, is it's, it's a it's almost essentially if the lambda is all one, then this is a transpose. So it's uniquely determined by 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 your original data. Okay. Then the lemma is that for the new phi prime, it has the same exchange change set. And you can write down a mutation matrix immediately. Uh, it's given by A times M times B. Uh, this is such a simple calculation I would like to show you. Okay, just a two-line calculation. Um, remember, I need to compute, oops, I, I need to compute the, the, this one. I need to compute this thing here. I want that to be zero, so I just put it in, plug it in. Right, I just put in the definition. And then A squared is identity. So I'm left with uh, this product here, and then, and then by definition, the first part is zero, so the whole thing is zero. So this shows that that zero weight condition is satisfied. And then why is the second condition? Why is this a mutation matrix? So you need to multiply this two, okay? And then again, you put in the definition. So this is, as I said, this is the definition. You plug it in and using the fact that A squared is one identity, and then you get to here. So because A squared disappears, and then you use the fact that um, this omega times m is lambda, then you get to here. And then you use the fact that lambda b is given by a transpose times lambda, you get a transpose square lambda. And then a square is identity, you get lambda. Okay, so that's a very simple proof. Um, that's what, uh, so, so, so this very basic lemma says that I can, now I can continue to mutate because I got, naturally I got a mutation matrix for the new uh, coordinate chart, right? Okay, so now if I want to write it down explicitly, uh, so if uh, so if I want so if, if the original, uh, in terms of the original mutation matrix, if you multiply out, you see that you get this formula. So uh, any of you, if you have ever looked at any paper on class algebra or listened to a talk in class algebra, you will see this formula. Uh, so this formula was very mysterious to me at the beginning. Um, but anyway, so all the papers normally start with this formula. So this is the mutation formula for the mutation matrix. So what we have discovered here is the mutation rule for the seed, okay? So not only I mutate the, uh, the coordinate charts, uh, change to a new one, but I have also told you how to change the mutation matrix. Okay, so this is exactly what's happening in class the algebra. In class the algebra, they mutate a seed in particular, that this is how you mutate a seed in cluster algebra. Okay, here we got this in, by requiring, by, the, by solving that two uh, equations. Um, in fact, so far, everything I have explained is all more or less uh, uh, in, the, in the literature. And especially if you, if you do quantum cluster algebras, you need, uh, you, need um, you don't necessarily have the T part, but you always have the Poisson part. They call that a comparable, sorry, compatible pair. Um, so, so this is so so this is all uh, somewhere in the literature. Um, my next question is when the mutation matrix is unique. If you remember that we saw for the mutation matrix from the two linear equations, um, they don't have to be. Uh, in general, I don't see why the mutation matrix matrix has to be unique. So what I said is that if you can solve one, you just put it there and put that as a column of the mutation matrix. And then so a priori, you may not have a unique mutation matrix. Although what I discussed is that if at the beginning you have a mutation matrix, then you stick to the program. Then, then, then you just define the new one by, by this formula. Okay, so as long as you have the original one, the M5, you get, uh, then from there on, you have a, a prescribed way of, uh, for the mutation matrix, a prescribed way of producing the mutation matrix. Uh, the question is, even at the beginning, there may not be a unique one. Uh, I just don't see why there is a unique one. And then the theorem is, in fact, very beautiful. It says that if you have a single T leaf, okay, so if your Poisson variety has only one single T leaf, then there's only one, okay? Then there's a unique mutation matrix. So, so from the very beginning, starting with your T-Poisson coordinate chart, you only have one, um, one, one mutation matrix. That is the solution that that linear system of, system of linear equations has only one solution. 
has a unique solution. Okay, now again, the reason is extremely simple. So I want to explain why do I require this to be a single tea leaf. It's, remember a single tea leaf means that the tea orbit together with the simplet leaf, they infinitesimally generate the whole tangent space. Yeah, so I just use that condition. So a key step in the proof is that if you have, if you have, for example, you look at two, suppose you have two, then you have to argue a little bit because I have this uh, other conditions in the definition. So though they all require, they all um, reduce the uniqueness to the following question. If I have a MK, which is killed by chi phi and killed by omega phi, do I, is MK equal to zero? Okay, so it reduces to this. But this condition is the same as saying that this particular co-vector uh, lies in, so, so the first condition says is annihilates, it lies in the annihilator of the tangent spaces to the orbit, T orbit. It also lies in the kernel of the Poisson operator, right? Now, uh, by requiring this whole thing to be a T leaf means that this, this thing is zero, right? So T leaf means that uh, there's nothing, if it, it has to annihilate that orbit, annihilates tangent direction to the symplectic leaf direction must be zero. Okay, so geometrically, so this is very clear. Yeah? So geometrically, these two conditions that I'm imposing basically, yeah, so if this is, if it's zero under those conditions, then it must be zero. Just simply because the design, by design, I have a T leaf. Okay, all right, so let me summarize. Um, oh, I don't have, so let me just quickly summarize. So, so phi, let's phi be a T plus according to the chart on the T plus variety. Um, so how do we form? So we solve for primitive um, column vectors and we form a mutation matrix. And then we mutate in each direction uh, to get a T plus C. Okay, then we carry this out in all possible directions in all possible mutations. So this way we, get, we obtain a collection of T plus seeds. So this is all I have said so far, okay? So from the, so this is, this is how we mutate T plus on seeds. But the most important, I think that what is new I, I, so far is, uh, I, I have not seen this in the literature, at least written down in the literature. If T is a single T leaf, why is a single T leaf? I want to say that the mutation program is written in the DNA of this phi. <laughs> what I mean is that there's only one way of solving for the mutation matrix. Okay, there's absolutely just no other choice. It's already inherit, inherently uh, built inside into this phi. There's only one solution. So, so what this means is that phi intrinsically determines a unique mutation equivalence class of key Poisson seeds. So that's the, so, so then uh, in, uh, in terms of, uh, so morally this is very, very, very nice. So if you have a T, if you know your underlying Poisson manifold is a single T leaf, like, like, like uh, it is the case for the double Bruja cells, then as long as you have chosen uh, initial uh, T Poisson coordinates, uh, coordinates then you know there is a single way of mutating. You can get, you have the potential of, of getting a, a whole class of uh, T plus on seeds. Okay, so, so far this is, uh, so you can see that all of this is very easy. Um, what I have explained so far, I hope is just linear algebra and then this is all very easy. Um, it's by definition, it's easy because uh, I, can, I can understand it. So <laughs> the, the harder part, Ah, so maybe before before that, so let me just say uh, in the language of a class the algebras. So E X. Now since this is the same set for every phi, so this is called exchange set. It just it's called exchange set. And those which do not are not in the exchange set are not allowed to change. So they are frozen. So they stay there. They are frozen variables. And then we define this to be a, so that then just use the round a square bracket to denote the mutation equivalence class of seeds. And then, uh, so now what I call class of variables. So these are all the new rational function you can produce by any sequence of mutations, right? So if you do one mutation, you can produce a new function. You do another mutation, all possible sequences of mutations, you produce um, potentially a lot of new functions. So these are all new rational functions. Yeah, so they are also called cluster variables. So this is all in the language of class algebra. And the class of variables from the same seed, from one from the same seed, okay, different, not the different seeds, from the one single seed, they, they call it a cluster. And so a cluster is the, the collection of all cluster variables from one single seed. Okay, so the cluster algebra, 
is the C subalgebra of the field of rational functions generated by all the cluster variables together with the frozen variables and their inverses. So this is the definition of a cluster algebra. Okay, so as I said, everything here so far is all very simple because uh, uh, either definitions or, or simple linear algebra um, plus some uh, consideration. The harder part, um, uh, the harder part is to is to find a good initial t possum coordinate coordinate chart such that the cluster algebra you generate is the same as the algebra of rational uh, of regular functions on your variety. Okay, so that is that is almost like luck. You must. This is not uh, absolutely no guarantee in general that this is the case. Okay, so it, because you, you keep generating the function you generate, they are all rational functions, okay? This is a huge requirement. You want all the cluster variables you generate to be regular functions. Not only that, you want, to, you want the algebra generated by all of them to be precisely the coordinate ring of your variety. Um, now, uh, geometrical in, uh, 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 implication of this is the, so, by, is the result of the, so, the famous Laurent phenomena. Which, which says that if this is the case, because every class of variable is actually a Laurent polynomial in the, in the, uh, the variables in any seed, okay? So geometrically, so, so if, you, if, if the whole class algebra is the algebra of regular functions, that means that you can embed your algebra of regular functions into the polynomial, the Laurent polynomial ring. So geometrically, if you, this means that you have a toric embedding because the Laurent polynomials is the uh, algebra functions for torus. Okay, so you pull back, so, so, so you get an embedding. So that's the same as embedding, but this depends on so the famous Laurent phenomena. So in, so in particular, you get, yeah, so, so you get, so these are called cluster tori. Okay, that's in this good situation, you get this. It's even better, you wonder like how many, how many tori you get, um, how much do they cover? So if the cluster tori, all the collection of all the cluster tori cover your variety up to co-dimension two, this is an even better situation, right? You know, it's, it's very big. It, and in terms of uh, cluster algebra, it means that uh, the cluster algebra is the same as the upper class algebra. So I will not explain that. And so just in terms of uh, geometrically, it just means that you have uh, lots of tori, cluster tori that cover your variety up to co-dimension two. Okay, for the case of double Broca cell, and this is indeed the case. And this is, as I said, this is the harder part and it involves lots of work by people. So originally by Bernstein, Fulmin, Zelovinsky, and then they talk about the upper class the algebra part. Kudrow Yakimov have some theory, uh, and then I think it's some unpublished work. And Lin Hui Shen and Wang, they have uh, for a more general, uh, the proof, um, they also have a proof. Okay, so the statement is that, how do you produce an initial key Poisson seat for the double Braha cell? you use a reduced word for U and V, okay? Each reduced words will produce one. Um, and more I did not write down, they are all mutationally equivalent. So no matter which reduced word you use, and they are all mutation equivalent. Moreover, the, uh, the ones, yeah, they are, so, so therefore you get the same cluster algebra structure. So this, I'll call this one the BFZ for Bernstein, Fulmin, Zelovinsky cluster structure. Um, it's the same story on the so-called reduced double Braha cell, you divide by T. Okay, so get rid of one copy of the torus. Uh, where now these are again T leaves, where you T, T, T now has the quotient Poisson structure by the quotient divided out by T. And then this reduced double Braha cells are the T leaves. Okay, now there's the same story for more generalized. So I will now talk about this. So not only for the double Braha cell for a pair of vowel group elements, this can be sequences of vowel group elements. So it's more general. Uh, so the whole same story. So what same story meaning that you have a good initial T Poisson coordinate chart. And then you follow, because these are all T leaves. So conceptually, philosophically, you know there is an equivalence class of T Poisson seeds. And the theorem says that the, that the seeds are so, is so good that uh, the, the class of algebra you get is precisely the, regular, the ring of regular functions of your variety. Okay, so I need to hurry up. Uh, so now this is only now gets to my last part. Um, sorry, I just have a few minutes. I'll just go through this uh, quickly. The I want to talk about a particular example. Um, so again, uh, this. So I start with the same G, 
And this time I choose a Coxter element. Uh, so this is the product of all the simple reflections. Um, okay, and then we talk, I look at double reduced, uh, reduced double Bruja cell. Reduced means divided by T, but, but this time I actually embedded in, instead of in a quotient, I embedded into G and this is, you can express it in terms of this. Um, now the big thing, uh, the, 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 the major thing about this particular case is that the Bernstein formula that Vinci cluster structure is of finite type. What does that mean finite type? Finite type means that it has finite many cluster variables or finite many uh, cluster tori. Okay, now that's a rare thing. If you think about the way that you, you, uh, you mutate, um, uh, so you have only finite many uh, cluster tori you get. So that's called a, a finite type. Uh, this is, is actually, um, is, a one, is another big theorem in class algebra theory that class algebras of finite type are, uh, are classified in the same way you classify simple, uh, complex simple Lie algebras or Dinkin diagrams or Cartan matrices is the same classification. That, that's a, a, a big theorem uh, at the beginning of cluster theory. And everything about class algebras of finite type is in here. This is a loaded uh, sentence. <coughs> um, the, I, 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 it'll, it'll, I mean, this takes, takes a whole lecture to explain what this means, okay? So there's uh, lots of papers on just class algebras of finite type. Um, there's one paper about the geometry relating it by Jan Zelensky that I'll mention later on. Uh, so my, so um, what I want to talk about, so there's a lot one can say about class algebras of finite type, uh, lots of Lie theory involved. Uh, what I want to say for the next couple of minutes, actually, uh, just to describe the, now in general for all the Bruja cells is very hard, double Bruja cells is very hard to describe all the toric charts or all the cluster variables. The cluster variables you get in general are no longer generalized minors, they can be very complicated, but um, the story in the case of this finite type is very beautiful and then it's possible to describe all the cluster toric charts. So this is what I want to explain. Um, so, so first of all, first of all, about this variety itself, it's, it's very simple to visualize what this variety looks like. Um, so it's actually, so first of all, I define R polynomials with two R variables in this particular way, uh, involving the Cartan integers. So all you need to start with is just the Cartan, the Cartan matrix, which is underlying the, the Dinkin diagram, the finite type. Yeah? So you start with this, and then your LCC inverse is nothing but the Zariski open, it's isomorphic to the Zariski open subset of C to the 2R, just simply given by this. So this is how you visualize the variety. Okay, so it's very explicit. And then the initial, I want to describe the Poisson bracket, okay, so it involves too much, but the initial T Poisson coordinates is this, is just this one. So the, the first R coordinates plus plus P1, P2, and PR. So that will be your initial T Poisson coordinate chart. The, uh, this omega, and these are expressed in terms of the Cartan integers between the roots. So I will not explain that. Uh, then the, the, the mutation matrix looks like this. So this is very explicit. I've been talking about mutation matrices, but never showed you one. So, so this here is um, a very explicit one. So it's a tall one, it's size R by two R, sorry, two R by R. So the top is, is this one, bottom is this one made of, uh, it's all made of Cartan integers. And then all the cluster variables are polynomials. So this is a very striking figure feature. In fact, this is, yeah. Okay, now what we'll look at, in fact, is I'm not, I'm not going to look at that one. I'm going to change the initial T Poisson coordinates to a slightly different one where I change the frozen variables to, to by a monomial change. This is not going to change much except that, so this is still going to be a T Poisson, initial T Poisson coordinate chart. But now that the corresponding seed is, has principal coefficients. So if you study Poisson uh, class the algebra, you know the principal, so-called principal coefficient case is extremely important. So if you do this slight change, you get to the principal coefficients. And then, then these two are not much different at all. They are so-called quasi-isomorphic. So not, not big change. Um, the cluster variables in, in for this principal coefficient one has been studied by, have been studied by Jan Zelavinsky, so I'll call this one, the new one, call this the Jan Zelavinsky cluster structure. For the case of SLN, it just looks, the variety looks like this. It's very simple. You can write down all the cluster 
uh, you can write down the all the initial extended cluster. It just uh, looks they all given by um, miners. Okay, so all the middle block miners. Okay, so uh, the coordinate the combined so there is the, so this is actually the the, the major part. Um, th there exists a, a combinatorial, appro combinatorial approach to the young Zelovinsky cluster structure. So it's well known the number of cluster variables is finite. So it's just the rank plus the length of the uh, longest element. So we start with a, a reduced work. So this is a reduced work for C. Then you form like infinite many copy. Then you choose the so-called lexicographically left most reduced subword of W naught. So this is called, you choose the reduced word for W naught from this C infinity. And then you put a copy of C in front of it. So now the size is exactly D, okay? So now, and so I will be done with my uh, theorem. So um, K, a subset is called a facet. If the subword count, if the subword of this big word by deleting the letters at position K is a reduced word for W naught. And then this is a, a well-known fact that clusters are in one-to-one -one correspondence with such facets. So this is a description of the clusters. So now our main theorem uh, is that we can now we have we have a geometrical approach to understand how to understand the cluster tori. So for that, I need to go to the Balsamiusen variety defined by this word. This is a standard, standard construction. The Balsamiusen variety is famously and uh, has uh, two to the d coordinate charts, d being the dimension now, and each chart is parameterized by uh, is it, affine, is c to the d. Uh, a particular one, so there is a very important one. So there is one for each subset, okay? So that if you take the whole subset, I call that O, and this whole subset has a very nice uh, parameterization um, um, by which I call the box semis and coordinates. Okay, then the theorem, then this is our major main theorem is that how do I find, so I can embed the, uh, the LCC inverse inside the open part of the, of the uh, Balsamiusen variety in such a way that for the young Zelovinsky, uh, so for the Ze so young Zelovinsky cluster structure, two things happen. First of all, the cluster variables are precisely, so under this embedding, remember this O is, is parameterized by C to the D. So I have Balsamiusen coordinate charts, uh, coordinates. So the restriction of the Balsamiusen coordinates are precisely all the cluster variables. And, and secondly, the cluster tori are just the intersections of this LCC inverse with all the other open charts on the Balsamiusen variety where K is a facet. Okay, so that's the theorem. I think that's the, um, so the, the essence of the theorem is that we can study the young Zelovinsky cluster structure by embedding the variety inside the Balsamiusen variety the Balsamiusen variety has a lot of nice open charts. You simply intersect your, your, your LCC inverse with the other charts, and that's how you get your toric charts. But that's a geometrical way of visualizing um, uh, where you get the coordinate charts. But there are lots of other lots of questions involved. Uh, I don't have time to explain. Okay, thank you. So I think I have the reference here. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, that's the end of my talk. Uh, thank you. Since now is the coffee break, I think we have questions for questions or remarks that, oh, Anton. Hi, hello, that's Anton. Uh, thanks a lot for a nice talk. Uh, Hi, Anton. Uh, so I have the following possibly naive question. So you consider um, this uh, double Bruchassel, which corresponds mm -hmm. to CC minus one. But, right. but what if uh, we consider even a simpler cell, which corresponds to C and identity, or you, you know, if you make one of them smaller oh. and eventually yeah, maybe that, that, that's there's then then okay, but there is just a torus. If you take C comma identity, that one is just a torus. Uh, you get uh, you don't do anything. It's itself is isomorphic to torus. The Poisson structure is not canonical. Uh, it's just it's torus with a standard. The whole variety is interesting, yeah. Uh, but but um, yes, but it's not okay. Okay, they are also. Fine. I think they are okay. No, uh, no. I think I'm not sure uh, whether maybe somebody in the audience knows. 
Um, for example, you can take CC uh, instead of CC inverse, uh, or you can take a smaller C. I think they are all finite, but they are, don't have to be finite type of the same carton type. Do you see what I mean? Because the finite, uh, you can take like A1 cross A1 or A1 cross, but like if you mm -hmm. take C comma C, what you get is, is N copies of type A1. Okay, okay, that sounds interesting. Oh, think, Thank wait, you. Wait, 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 I think, I think, uh, I, I don't know whether, uh, yeah, I think, I think so. Yeah, the, the thing is, the good thing is that the CC inverse, uh, the, the type is precisely, mm. so the type as a class algebra is the same as, it's the same type as the Dinkin diagram. Mm. Okay, Th thank you. Yeah, thank you. Are there any other questions around? No? Oh, Marco. Hi, thanks for a great talk. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, have you seen uh, any investigation of the deformation theory of these Poisson uh, cluster varieties? I, I imagine that you could use the cluster structure to study their deformation theory, and maybe they could deform to things which are not clustered. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Who 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 is this? It's is Marco. It? Hi. Marco. Hi, Marco. Hi. Um, right. I mean, the, the whole I sh I should have mentioned the whole point about this is that you have uh, this class this tori, then you can use this to for quantization. Uh, well, I'm not sure you are you are talking about quantization or just the de degeneration. Uh, the, okay, I can say both. For, for quantization, both. For of course, both. this is how you do, how you go to the whole quantum class the algebra because your your whole thing is covered by tori, and then you quantize each tori. You know how to quantize tori, and then you use the you also know how they are glued together, and this tells you how to quantize the whole thing. Uh, this is uh, so all the quantum class the algebra business uh, you have to start with. Uh, this is the beginning part of the quantum class the algebra. Now there's also in, so that this particular case there's also degeneration. Um, uh, in particular, the way that we embed it into the Bosch-Samuelson variety, and then we can degenerate, you can degenerate. First of all, you have a compatification because I only have my LCC inverse sits inside an open subset. I can take, as an open subset, I can take the closure and then I can, I can deform to a zero fiber. Then you actually, it's very interesting, you get a toric variety and then which is, uh, um, whose uh, polytope is what's so-called the polytope attached to this class the algebra. Uh, is that deformation? Like the, uh, Sorry? Is that deformation, that degeneration, that's a Poisson deformation as well? Uh, there is, a, yeah, there, there, you can also do a Poisson degeneration. Uh, I actually had a, yeah, you can also do Poisson degeneration. You, what you get is a the very different kinds of degeneration. Uh, Yes, you can do a Poisson degeneration as well. That's true. For any Samuelson variety with a standard Poisson structure, you can degenerate to a Poisson uh, toric variety. But this degeneration here I was talking about is slightly different. I degenerate to a toric variety. I think there's perhaps no longer a Poisson structure. I mean, not a natural one because I, I, I cautioned out too much. Uh, yes, the, the, the answer, the simple answer is yes. And, and I, there's, yeah, there's also compactification, uh, degeneration. Yes. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I did not, not very precise, but. Uh. Okay, so are there any other more questions? Well, if not, let's thank Jiang Walu again. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And we can resume now and go into coffee and then we'll back in a while. Thank you.